<laughs> this, this is my tenth year working with, with, with colleagues now on um, different kind of ped pedagogical projects. And I was just thinking, I was sitting up there, uh, the average manslaughter charge on prison sentence is five <laughs> years, and you have to for good behaviour, so it's been a long time. But you know, this has been a crucial circle of influence for me in terms of uh, pedagogy and learning. I've, I've done it all here over the last um, 10 years with you. And so I'm going to talk to you about classroom courses. Um, and I, was really I became really interested in this over the last few years, but I'd just like to tell you very briefly why. Um, I finished my law degree and I went off to do a PhD in the United Kingdom. And for the first year, I struggled really, really badly um, because I couldn't do critical thinking and I couldn't deal with messy knowledge. Um, it, all my degree, it ticked all the boxes, but it was, it was simply modules, you complete the module, you apply what you learned in the module, and that was it done. And it was described, outlined, perfect. Perfect for me in law. And then I got to the United Kingdom, and I was kind of well, critically thinking about this, how are you going to shape this? And I really struggled. It's almost like a, you, know, you talk about threshold concepts and so on. I absolutely really struggled for a year to try and do something in a, in a critical way. It was, it was a skill that I had not learned at all. Um, and the other thing I hadn't learned was dealing with knowledge outside specific modules. was not able to do that either. Um, and I think, um, I've been 13 years in UCC and now I'm in UL. I don't think legal education has changed that much in the interim period. And part of the reason for that probably is that m when you do a law degree, you, you have to go on to do a professional uh, practice afterwards. So you have to go into Blackhall Place, you have to go to King's Inns. And so very often the applied learning is taking place in those environments not at the university level. And it's got to such an extent now that you don't even need a law degree to go and do become a solicitor or a barrister. So it shows you the emphasis that is on you know, your, your, your broad understanding at undergraduate level. And um, so when I think back on my education, one of the things I was always interested in is why weren't we bringing things together? Why, was I, why did I have such a deficit? Why do we still have these deficits? And so I started to say, I asked, could I do the one on capstone courses? Not because there's an opportunity to do empirical research in a, in, in a law degree, but to find out more about capstone courses and see, just looking at all the literature that existed, what, um, you know, what are the benefits, what are the limitations, what does it try to do, and what does it try to do, in particular from an integrative perspective. So that's where I'm coming uh, from. And so just initially, it's historical conditions of emergence where did it come from? The idea of capstone courses really came out of disciplines of sociology, psychology, communications, and business, particularly in the US. This idea of having yeah, culminating experiences for students at undergraduate level. And by now, they're being used in most disciplines. They're multifunctional, and this is something that uh, I was really interested in. So, why, and it's becoming really important in terms of metrics, it's just from looking at the literature. Um, from a university perspective, they're very, they, they provide transparency and, a, and accountability about program learning outcomes. So, if you think about the depths that I was talking about, it's module learning outcomes that we're running with that. Whereas with capstone courses, you're measuring, if you're, inter if you're committed to it, you're measuring program learning outcomes. And that becomes very important for the professions. So in terms of you know, accrediting, but it also becomes very important for universities in terms of what they're achieving. Um, that's one. It's obviously it's crucially important for students because it encourages deep learning with, with, with uh, uh, deep understanding as well, and we'll talk about that. But it also provides an opportunity for town to meet down and for, for you know for, for uh, uh, building up net networks with communities, with businesses, with uh, professional practice and with service providers. And they can be very flexible in design. I'm going to talk to you about those as well. You can you know you can arrange a capstone in a variety of different ways. And in fact some really good capstone courses will in embody maybe three or four different techniques. Portfolios perhaps, field work it might involve a, a research dissertation and so on. So you can combine as part of the capstone course. Okay. So one of the key um, threads that comes out in the literature when you look at capstone courses is that it's 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 a transitional point. And why is it tra capstone courses? They act as a point of transition. Why? Because they allow, for example, they can act as a bridge between undergraduate and postgraduate education or they can act as a bridge between theory and practice, or they can act as a bridge between disciplines. So you might have a law and accounting degree, and a capstone course provides you with a space in which to bring both together. And again, law and accounting, when it was done, when I was you know, studying law, it was a degree, but never the twain shall meet. Um, and so what a capstone course allows you to bring uh, disciplines together, it allows you to bring 
postgraduate under, or it, it, it just allows you to pass through a threshold in terms of undergraduate education. But also, it allows you to move um, between the world of um, academia and work. Um, but, and even you can distill that down even further between student communities of practice. This is for professions and professional communities of practices. And so, and very often the accreditation takes place here. Um, and so, you know, the other thread that increasingly come, comes across if you're talking about capstone courses, you're talking about this attempt to get away from fraction knowledge. And that's exactly what I was talking to you about, that, you know, I ticked all the boxes in terms of a law degree, but I couldn't put it together, and I certainly couldn't think critically about it. And they usually occur as a culminating experience, because by its very nature, you know, Bailey has raised something that's interesting with this, a culminating experience at the end of a degree program. Now the danger with that is, it, can you have one culminating experience or should you be doing it at the end of each year? And that's a, that raises a very interesting question. And finally, and James, I know you like this kind of, this language is probably there, liminal. Okay, that's the liminal threshold at which students can change their status. So from being a student to being a practitioner, from being a student doctor to being a, a professional doctor or a dentist, or, uh, so it allows you to change in that way. I mean, to think like a lawyer, to think like an accountant or whatever. Okay, the integrative object, no, obviously the integrating thread is the key. So what are the integrating objectives of capstone courses? And there's two that we can talk about. The first one is backward looking. So it's trying to get the student to, to look back over the course of their, their program of study and apply what they learned. That's backward looking. But it's also forward looking in the sense that it can allow students to develop soft skills, something like critical thinking, teamwork, and communication skills, problem solving, and so on. So those soft skills are forward looking as well. And so when we're looking at the back, backward looking ones, what can I catch? And if it's done properly, what can it do? Well, the first thing is it can, has, it can have a synthesizing effect. And so they often talk, in, in the key writers in the field, like Durrell and so on, they talk about, you know, a capstone course can act as a magnet, okay, which can pull together all the relevant scenes of prior knowledge that you've learned in your program study, if done properly. That's what, so that's one thing, the synthesizing effect, bringing that knowledge together, instead of students just being able to, you know, think about it in the silos. And that, we talked earlier about disruption, that can have a very disruptive effect because we're, we're demanding the student to go back. But you, you don't just get to finish a module, that's it, that's done, that's part. It, it uh, brings it back to you at a later point. And that creates a messiness of knowledge and so on, but it is requiring you to come back. So that's, a, that's important in terms of synthesizing effect. Reflection. Okay, again, there's really to say with that, so you know, again, from an integrated perspective, allows you to go back. A application, applying what you're learning across your program of study. And closure. You know, you have the relevant curriculum, you have the relevant program of study for this, at this transitional point, and now we can move on to the next. So they're the backward looking ones. Um, and the other one then is forward looking, it's the soft skills, it's the you know, holistic thinking, enhance, enhancing all the variety of different soft skills that, that, one, um, that you may want in a particular program of study. Techniques. Uh, a whole variety of different techniques, and it's interesting to watch what they're doing in, in universities like Harvard and so on around this whole area. So the obvious one is field work, um, and there's some really interesting studies done. As, you know, I've given examples from civil engineering programs where uh, they're building p pedestrian bridges with communities, and engineers are going to apply everything they've learned in that field. Um, the other one that was interesting was issue, issues oriented modules. And this came up that I didn't know about this until I started to kind of read the literature. But this might be, do you know sometimes in a, in a program of study, you may touch on something very often, but it may never be a specific module. So mm -hmm. the example I give you in law would be adversarialism. Mm -hmm. Okay, and all that means is that we, do, we, we, if we touch upon it all, all the time, but we never teach it. It's like the grammar of a language. It's acted upon, but rarely articulated. So what that means is that you have to say it in court and you can be cross-examined out. So what's really important then in adversarialism is the principle of orality, saying it in court, mm -hmm. being cross-examined out, being able to communicate. Mm -hmm. But the students, would, they know what it is, but they don't, you know, because it's touched upon, but they never actually, it's never really articulated for them um, until they see it in court. Mm -hmm. The one that's interesting from an issues oriented module in psychology would be consciousness mm -hmm. and subconsciousness. 
But as a team, you know, they, they were saying they never did, did this as a, as, a, as a module. And so, but it runs right throughout the whole, as a true line, through the psychology curriculum. And so what they did was, let's have an issues oriented module around consciousness. So you're bringing it to the fore, but it, and it touches upon every module, so it's backward looking, and, and it's something that could be done. Without having to go out in the field, it could be seminar based. International learning experience. Now, this is the one where her, you, you're increasingly seeing, these are called acculturation, acculturation studies, where, for example, in Harvard, they have this field study. If you're in the Harvard Business School and you're doing your MBA there, you have to spend two weeks in South America working with local NGOs, local stakeholders, developing entre entrepreneurship skills. Now, that's entirely, again, it's based on um, disturbing your, you know, your embedded patterns of thinking. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's participant-centered, and it's very short. It's not like this year abroad. It's very specific, very short. And increasingly, I don't know much about business, but you're beginning to see these type of fieldwork experience, international fieldwork experiences being brought in. It's designed again to integrate because you're drawing upon all the skills and you're using them in a specific environment. One that um, is it, it, one where you're not familiar with and you're having to deal with uh, you know, different types of problems. Simulations, case studies, you're familiar with those, problem-based learning, reflection activities, internships, research projects. So for example, there's a really interesting one in Dan as chief editor of this project. In history, in I think it was Virginia Tech University, they had a book project. So master students in history, but they, their, their capstone course was to develop and edit a book, a collection of essays. But what they were learning through that was um, how to be good historians, what constituted good history, uh, what constituted quality work, how do you put it together as a, as a, as a book, um, and you know, writing introductions and conclusions that encapsulate everything that's being done. Um, so that, and then service learning, and that's becoming more important, community learning, service learning. So for example, nursing courses, um, uh, you, know, you, you might have an immunization fair for the flu vaccine over a three day period. And again, you know, the nursing students then are having to deal with members of the public and all the different variety of issues that arise through that. Okay, so benefits and wider significance, and I'll go through this very quickly. What's seen through the literature Capstone courses are seen as crucial, okay? They're particularly good at macro assessment. And this is the program learning outcomes rather than the module learning outcomes. And of course, it's, like, it's very transparent and acts as a benchmark. That's excellent. It can highlight student weaknesses. And if we're really committed to it, we can see what are students not learning? Mm -hmm. So a really good example would be um, civil engineering again. They discovered to this a capstone course that students were not good at cost estimation. So that you know, they were really good at the, you know, the, the civil engineering itself and the different aspects of that, but they weren't good at costing civil engineering projects. So they introduced an economics, in, engineering economics module to help with that. So they could see they were not achieving the program learning outcomes. There was a weakness. The capstone course highlighted that weakness, and it could be acted upon. It, again, no, this requires you know, commitment. It, it encourages academic staff to re-examine basic assumptions. If it's been taken seriously, there are weaknesses here. We need to develop this, and um, so, um, these are obviously at an institutional, academic level. And then for students, it certainly promotes deep learning. It promotes student independence and creativity. And um, within a scaffold space, it bridges the theory practice gap. It builds pathways between disciplines, which is important if it works well. It embeds generic skills. We have talked about it. Achieves that employability. A number of the studies talked about that students who kind of were engaged in these capstone courses who could not only reflect the academic content but could match it then with the practice content were more likely to be employed afterwards um, or would do better at interviews and so on because they were already experiencing something beyond the modules. They, you know, they, they, they were beginning to see, think more holistically and see the program thinking like lawyers, thinking like engineers and so on and the difficulties that arise. And it would also confirm student interest in the program of study capstone course itself because now you can really see and the converse would also be true and it became a, an excellent conduit for wider professional and civic engagement the, you know, because it was as a course a capstone course it acts as a bridge between communities and between academia so that's what it did really well but here are the limitations and um, it's fine speaking about all the positives and this when it works well, it's fantastic. 
one minute. Is it perfect? Okay. Very often, overly ambitious uh, course module designs. And I see it myself, you know, I work on an MA in chronology program here. 30 credits for the final year, the dissertation. We fill it in there. That, that would plug that gap. But not, you know, it's, it's a dissertation. But what are you trying to achieve through this dissertation? Uh, you know, in terms of criminology and so on. What, why doesn't this link with the program learning opens? What do you want from this? And very often some would say insufficient rigorous because, again, it's plugging a gap as opposed to a seriously, being seriously committed to it. Sometimes unduly restrictive. This would be very true of final year projects. You can only do it in criminal law or, or this. So you're limiting what the students can do. And that's not backward looking because you're not drawing, it's not a magnet then when you're limited in that way. Class sizes and resources become a big issue. And so very often, you know, there's an increased pressure being put on programs, more students. We need to fill, we need more FTEs and so on. That does not sit well with these type of courses because think about the logistics involved with, with working with stakeholders, internships, communities and so on. Um, people not understanding what they're meant to do, so covering new content and, you know, Academics think I can't have a capstone course where we're reflecting on three years of work. First of all, <coughs> the knowledge is too broad for me. And secondly, we need to teach them something new. This is what we do. And that trying to get over that hurdle has been difficult. The loss of educational control is a major issue. And there's two issues there that arise. And so you know and it was mentioned here, I think elementary the, the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. If you're if you have a capstone course where you're working with local stake, bi, bi, you know, stakeholders such as businesses, local communities and so on. It may be those local businesses and local communities that are assessing our students. We find that difficult to let go of, from a transparency perspective. The second danger with that is, <coughs> is procedures. What if the student fails? How do you repeat a capstone course in an academic year? It doesn't, they don't necessarily fit. Um, issues of pedagogy. And so this becomes, again, we like the module content. We like the control of our knowledge in our particular module. It becomes very difficult to engage with other disciplines and with knowledge beyond what I, I do evidence law, but I don't do contract law. Am I willing to be a course coordinator of a program about, about knowledge that I don't know enough about? And that has proved to be difficult. Workloads is the key issue, and it's not being reflected. To do a capstone course properly, and I'll finish this, to do a capstone course properly requires a huge workload. You've got to develop networks with the local communities, the local businesses, and so on. You've got to set up the capstone course. You've got to generate feedback loops. You've got to ensure at all times that the students are prepared and planning and all of that. And the argument that's often made is, I could write an international article, an article for an international journal, peer-reviewed, in six months. To do this will take, to do it properly, it takes a massive amount of time, and it will not help me in terms of my career. And that's something that keeps coming back. Um, and this is the issue about taking, you know, teaching seriously. Um, that people feel that, our academics in particular feel that, that the workload that this involves to do it properly. It's a fantastic idea. Um, it makes complete sense, but huge workload. Um, and then intra and interdisciplinary differences. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you.